Welcome back. You're watching ED Inside. Kingfisher Airlines may be sinking, but it is not the only one. India's aviation industry as a whole is spinning out of control and is saddled with losses of nearly 12,000 crore rupees. So just how bad is the situation and what can save the sector? Nikhil Shivadas finds out. India is one of the fastest growing aviation markets in the world. Yet its airlines are deep in the red. All major carriers except Indigo are loss making and full service carriers are burdened with massive debts. With fuel prices rising and airlines unable to raise tariffs, Indian carriers are finding themselves stuck between the devil and the deep sea. The airlines are having a really tough time though making any money out of this expansion and um, you know, at the moment there's too much capacity chasing those passengers and load factors have uh, fallen quite sharply. They're only about 75, only 75 percent of seats are filled which is uh, too low to make money in this market. It's certainly faced for several years this major problem of disparity between costs and, in, uh, and uh, fares that are charged and it's become worse because the fuel prices have been going up progressively. Crude oil prices are already above $120 now and therefore to be able to, uh, it's difficult all the time to pass on the increases and equivalent increases in fares to the customers. So how bad is the situation? According to CAFA, the accumulated losses and debts of airlines amounted to over 1 lakh crore rupees, with Air India accounting for over 70% of that, followed by Jet Airways and Kingfisher. The total losses of the sector were pegged at 38,000 crore rupees. Bank loans amounted to 70,000 crore rupees, and 10,000 crores was owed to vendors by the full service carriers. Which means that with the exception of debt free Indigo, all airlines are in the red and the situation is only getting worse. Jet Airways, which posted a loss of 101 crore rupees for the third quarter, has delayed salaries for two months in a row. Now the government has cleared a plan for a 28,000 crore rupee capital infusion for Air India over a 10-year period. That's not all. A consortium of 13 banks, led by the State Bank of India, have agreed to restructure Air India's debt worth 18,000 crore rupees and provide a fresh cash credit line of 2,200 crore rupees to the airline. Government needs to come in to support Air India because a major chunk of Air India losses are currently on account of the decisions taken by the government of India, largely aircraft acquisition in much larger numbers than what Air India could afford or gainfully deploy, merger between Air India and Indian Airlines, besides the fact that it's the government of India which decides on the board of directors, which takes all the key decisions. The government of India decides on the chief executive. So all these factors are determined by the government and as we say very often, the polluter pays. According to CAPA, Indian carriers will collectively lose $2.5 billion or 12,600 crore rupees in the 12 months ending March 2012. That's nearly 25% of the industry's total revenues of about $10 billion or 52,000 crore rupees. According to the Federation of Indian Airlines, fuel accounts for close to 40% of the total operating costs for airlines in India and the estimated annual fuel bill for the industry last year was more than 20,000 crore rupees. That huge bill came on the back of ATF prices rising 40% last year. Add to that a 16% depreciation in the rupee and what you have is a huge dent on the balance sheet of most carriers. There was an IITA report that assessed that a $1 increase in the base price of crude requires the aviation industry to recover over a billion dollars globally to compensate for it. So clearly aviation fuel has a very major, it's the largest operating expense of an airline. Airlines could have offset those costs with higher ticket prices, but the scope for raising fares is limited because competition in the industry is stiff. Besides which, the aviation regulator DGCA frowns upon fare hikes, which means that airlines cannot pass on the rise in cost to consumers beyond a predetermined point. This also implies that Indian carriers cannot charge higher fares during peak season to counter losses during leaner months. That's not all. Differential pricing or charging a premium for exit row seats and for additional checked-in luggage is not permitted. 
All this limits an airline scope to turn around. The DGCA has certainly looked into the matter and to avoid any or to uh, prevent any predatory pricing by the airlines, they have got a fixed, well, uh, fixed uh, uh, width of the price band. That you cannot exceed this price, you cannot be quoting less than a certain price. So depending on the uh, advance days or the booking is done, the prices are varying. The central point is that the airlines are unable to um, charge affairs which reflect their cost. So in any form of pricing that you do, as long as it doesn't reflect cost, it will not help. From pricing boost to a capital crunch. It's well known that aviation is a business that requires deep pockets. However, India's airline promoters are not large enough to absorb the losses in a business that can take years to turn around. So far, they have been able to survive because they can borrow from banks and other financial institutions. But banks will not lend to companies that are in the red. And if they do, the interest rates will be painfully high. The only way out of this debt trap is by raising fresh equity. And that's where FDI comes in. Not just for Kingfisher, but for the entire industry, I strongly believe that foreign direct investment by strategic investors should be permitted. While FDI in aviation is allowed, foreign carriers are prohibited from investing in their Indian counterparts. Even in more developed nations, there are restrictions on airline ownership. The government is working on changing that. Even so, critics argue that Indian carriers are still relatively new and still firming up on routes and destinations. They say that foreign players will ignore smaller destinations and only feed their international hubs, potentially denting the domestic aviation industry. That's perhaps why not everyone agrees to the idea of letting foreign players rule the Indian skies. We really feel that the longer term opportunity of India must lie with Indian operators. Uh, having said that, you know, we are a very small sort of cog in the wheel and finally we will really honor whatever the government decides. But, but we struggle with the fact that, that the government would entertain change of policy based on the health of some constituents of the, of the industry. Despite these problems, the Indian aviation sector saw a near 11% growth in demand last year. But growth in demand was way below the 17% expansion capacity. And this is where the operators seem to have gone wrong. In the past two years, private players have placed orders for over 400 aircraft of varying sizes. Buying new aircraft is an expensive proposition, which is why many airlines in India opt to go in for sale and lease back deals on their aircraft. Simply put, an airline buys aircraft but sells them to a leasing company which in turn leases it back to the airline. For instance, reports suggest that Air India is considering selling seven planes under this arrangement and then lease them back. That will enable the national carrier to reduce an estimated $600 million from its total debt. But sale and lease back arrangements are a double-edged sword. Airlines benefit because they do not have to factor in the cost of depreciating assets on their books. A disciplined management can use such deals to reduce their debt burden, grow operations and earn more to offset the higher long-term cost of leasing aircraft. The biggest advantage of course is it keeps uh, debt uh, off your backs and hence uh, interest and also depreciation because that goes to the books of the, the lessor. And you also make a tiny profit uh, on, on day zero of the transaction itself uh, when you uh, procure the uh, aircraft from the aircraft manu manufacturer and uh, sell it to the uh, to the lessor and ultimately lease it back to yourself. So you still have the aircraft but at a, a very, very tiny uh, cost impact and uh, that way you uh, manage a balance between your in incomes and your outflow. But inefficient operations could see such deals ballooning to unmanageable costs in future years. The other issue is the business model followed by airlines. A few years ago, most Indian carriers followed the hub and spoke model where traffic is routed from one central point. This model maximized revenues but led to lower craft utilization time. As more operators entered the market, passengers by airline dwindled and many switched to the point-to-point -point model which provides direct flights to and from a city. Here, aircraft utilization is superior but revenues are lower. Globally, airlines operate with both these models but in India, airlines follow only one path, raising their business risks.
the origin and destination of the traffic study reveals that the traffic does not necessarily or predominantly start from metro airports but now the smaller towns also generate a lot of traffic therefore the i think all, almost all airlines are now getting into smaller aircraft and are likely to resort to the hub and spoke so that their aircraft on the main trunk routes they get filled up and the seat occupancy goes higher aviation sector has learned tough lessons from the rise and fall of kingfisher airlines and now most carriers are concentrating hard on keeping costs to a bare minimum several airline operators have also asked the ministry to ensure a level playing field with foreign airlines in india operating on bilateral trade agreements and also asked for the sector to be granted infrastructure status which will help it avail lower taxes and hence rationalize costs If that happens and carriers can raise funds via FDI, the Indian aviation sector could well take win once again. But that's a distant reality. As of now, the aviation sector is in dire need of a quick turnaround. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Indian Insight. We'll be back next week. But until then, don't forget to write in with your feedback and suggestions. Thanks so much for watching.